Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, as we turn to your word, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive the message you have for us. Allow us to again be reminded of the supremacy of your son, Jesus Christ. That is, through him we are reconciled to you. I pray these things for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I often wonder if it bothers other Christians as much as it bothers me when you hear misrepresentations about Christ. Now, most of the time when I hear these things, it's just out of ignorance, which I guess is what it is. It's frustrating because this is basic things, but it is what it is, right? It's not somebody's fault that they don't know. Um, but every once in a while, you hear a very deliberate false teaching, a very wrong idea about Jesus and who he is. And these things, they, it drives me nuts. It really bothers me a lot. And, and uh, you know, we hear things from, oh, well, Jesus was a good moral teacher, uh, about which C.S. Lewis famously says, either Jesus was and is the Son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. But let us not come with any of this patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. To the idea that Jesus was a God, perhaps small g, not the God, capital G, um, or the belief that Jesus is a way to heaven, but not the only way to heaven, which of course he himself said, yeah, I'm the only way, so get it together, people. That's the Mark paraphrase. And there's many other of these that flow around in society. Now, it strikes me that these watered-down Jesuses, it's all too common. This Jesus of our culture has even made his way into our churches. And for a variety of reasons, people accept this nonsense, and they worship uh, this Jesus in their own image. An impotent, weak, common person. Yet, this conundrum is nothing new. Indeed, since the beginning of the church, we have seen this problem. The church has had to battle incorrect views of Jesus and his person and his work. In fact, this sort of weakening of Christ and mixing of Christian worship with other practices was a real problem for the early church in Colossae. And so the letter to this church, which is written by Paul, a church that he had never met in person, as it was founded by a man named Epaphras. And it appears that Paul wrote to this church at the hesting of Epaphras because he was concerned, having uh, taught them the true gospel, now false teachers were popping up and trying to worm their way in. And so Paul writes them a, a letter to encourage them, to say, stand firm on what you have been taught. And so in our message today, we're going to see Paul quote a well-known early hymn in order to make a point regarding the truth about Christ's place in creation and how he relates to the reconciliation between humanity and our creator God. And so we're going to answer the question, what is Christ's place in creation? And so if you would open your Bibles to Colossians, we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 15. There's a Bible in the back of your pews, or on your smart tablet or smartphone, or maybe you brought your own Bible. That's also terrific. Paper is not out of style. That is Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, as well as the beginning, the firstborn among the dead. And so he himself may become first in all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, by making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. 
And you were at one time sinners and enemies in your minds as expressed through your evil deeds. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy, without blemish, and blameless before him. And so I want to start by pointing us back to our mission statement, uh, which reads, uh, exalting Christ, proclaiming his word, building his church, and reaching the lost by the power of the Spirit. And as this passage is a primary scripture regarding the supremacy of Christ, which is why we exalt Christ, because he is worthy of exaltation, because he is supreme. And so, as I mentioned, Paul is here quoting a hymn from the time. The first section of this hymn begins by addressing Christ as supreme in creation. That is, that Christ is supreme in creation. And verse 15 begins with a bold assertion. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So let's unpack this a little bit. First, note what is said about God, that he is invisible. Now, I point this out to make the correlation with his infiniteness, right? The Bible tells us that God is spirit. He is infinite. And the fact is that we cannot fully comprehend him as finite beings. And so the best thing we can do is try to understand what he is like, who and what he has revealed himself to be. And one way that he has chose to make this revelation is through his son, Christ, the second person of the Trinity. And this hymn writer here tells us that this Son, this Christ, is the image of the invisible God. And so this both speaks to a physical reality and a spiritual reality. We know that humans were created in God's image. We don't get very far into the Bible before we learn that. Indeed, Adam was created in God's image, and all humanity too bears that, and yet we know that our version of the image is marred from the fall. In Christ, however, this mar does not exist. This image of God is perfected. Christ is the perfect human, fulfilling the role which Adam was originally created for, to rule and reign on earth on God's behalf. Further, recall that our God is a triune God. And so we define this as three persons in one essence. And so if Jesus is the image of God as the physical presence of him in time and space, which he is, then it is a correct understanding to say that Christ is the manifestation of the essence of God. Let me say that a little bit different way. Jesus, as the image of God, as the physical presence, presence of him in time and space means he became a man put on flesh we understand that that person is this essence of the Godhead now in physical form Hebrews 1 3 helpfully states this much he says the son is the representation of God's essence and so again the point here is that as mysterious as our triune God is as uh, infathomable for us to understand how this works, we see that God has chosen to reveal himself in a variety of ways, one of them being his son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. This brings us to this idea of firstborn, we're still at uh, verse 15. I think that uh, firstborn is a difficult translation because uh, Christ, that is the second person of the Trinity, was not created. He wasn't born in the human sense. He wasn't materialized. He always was. He's the eternal second person of the Trinity. Yet, we know that he was the first to be resurrected from the dead in a glorified body. Um, but this iteration of firstborn really isn't even reflected in that. As we've talked over the past several weeks, the idea of first fruits is more closely related to that concept. Um, and, and the New Testament does say a good bit about this idea of Christ as the first fruit of the resurrection from the dead, the first to receive a glorified body. But here, there's a little bit different priority. And so here, uh, the word is uh, protakatas. Protatakas. There we go. 
Three times fast. <laughs> no takers, okay. Takas. <laughs> it means firstborn. And it can mean firstborn, like in the sense of a, a child, a temporal sense. Oh, y'all parents have a firstborn child. Uh, but it also has uh, a meaning of preeminence or, or priority or superiority. Uh, and that's the correct understanding here. Uh, the New Living Translation helpfully offers, he, being Christ, existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. And so what's in view here, again, is Christ's superiority, that he is absolutely first, that he is sovereign over all creation. And verse 17 helps us by explaining he himself is before all things. Their meaning in a, a temporal concept, that Christ existed before any created thing, that he is the foremost over all creation because he is eternal, he's pre-existent. Scott McKnight put it this way, this may or may not be helpful. The people in the room smarter than me will like this. In these references, Christ's status, not his birth order, is in view. His superiority is more than his temporality. His status is superior because he is temporarily, temporally before all things. Hierarchically, he is above all things. And ontologically, that is in the sense of being, he sustains all things. The Son is superior in temporal priority as the pre-existent one. And he is hierarchically superior in a sense of being. And so the simplest way to say all of that, uh, which may lack precision, um, but it is to say that Christ is firstborn in a sense of comparison having to do with time. He was pre-existing time as we understand it. And he is over all in the sense of superiority or sovereignty. He is sovereign over all creation. And so again, the idea here is that this hymn is saying that the image of the invisible God is also firstborn over all creation. We can boil that way down, make it super easy in the idea that Christ is supreme over all creation. So verses 16 and 17 go on to explain this out a little more clearly. Uh, it starts with a four. This is a causative four. So we can just as well say because which would leave verse 15 to 16 as, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. We know all of this because all things in heaven and on earth were created by Him. And a dramatic pause. Christ is the creator of everything. Now this is consistent with what John tells us in his gospel uh, about the Word, the Word being Christ. All things were created by the Word. And so now y'all might find it surprising here what all means. All means all. Tough crowd today. <laughs> everything, all, everything is created, whether in heaven or on earth, the whole universe, things whether visible or invisible. We see a more categorical allusion to those things spiritual and those things physical. And though the author spends no more ink on the physical here, I think it's important for us to make this connection. The author doesn't say any more because it's what's obvious to us. It's the physical world which we see and understand. We will do well to still acknowledge uh, the profound mystery of a being who created everything that is. That means the atoms and the molecules, the trees and the grass, and the flowers, and the shrubs, and the amoebas, and the jellyfish, and the rocks, and the mountains, and the plains, and the valleys, and the birds, and the bees, and the fish, and the cows, and the chickens, and the stars, and the planets, and the moons, and the galaxies. And so as we look at creation, we are rightly filled with awe at the detail of the expanse, of which we are not capable of comprehending the size of the universe, and yet the detail in everything. All of which were created by and are held together or sustained by Christ. That's beautiful. Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk about a God worth worshiping. The God that created 
everything. So many. Further, Christ created all spiritual things. The author says thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Uh, to what or whom these specifically refer is greatly debated and argued about, but I think that we can safely understand that the general idea as it is these spiritual forces. Paul talks about these uh, in Ephesians 6.12, but it's throughout the Bible, right? It's this idea that there is a spiritual realm which we can't see. The point is that it is Christ who created all of these things also, and therefore, he has authority over them. And so all things were created through him and for him. So let's look at this for him. There are two things in view here. The purpose of all creation and Christ as the heir of all creation. So the purpose of all creation is to glorify Christ as Lord and King. Uh, this is a resounding concept all throughout the Bible. One notable passage is Philippians 2, 9 through 11, which reads as follows. As a result, God exalted him, being Christ, and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, there are, of course, other scriptures that make this point, but the idea is clear that Christ is supreme over all creation, things seen and unseen, things spiritual and things physical. Perhaps it is also worth noting that that means he is also superior over us that we are also under his authority. But maybe that's not relevant. <laughs> Additionally, we see that creation is for him. And so I think that the best way to understand that is that the position of an heir. So Hebrews 1, 2 tells us, uh, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Now, we understand what an inheritance is, right? Grandma passes away, and she leaves us the house. That is our inheritance. Uh, so in this case, all things pass away, and Christ is the heir. He receives all things. The inheritance is all creation. It is all things seen and all things unseen. And they will be given to Christ. Among other conclusions that we may draw from this is that it is the same Son who reconciles all creation, that created all creation, and is supreme over all creation. So this means for us a certainty in Christ's ability to fulfill the promised reconciliation for those who believe in him as Lord and Savior. What does that mean? It means that because Christ has authority over all things, we know that he can do what he said he did. Namely, provide salvation for us. Eternal life is in Christ. We know that he can keep his word in that because he created all things. He is supreme over all things. All things are under his authority. So when we go to bed at night and the enemy is scratching away at our confidence saying, are you really saved? Was this Jesus really who he said he was? Can you really be sure that you have eternal life? We can answer back to the enemy and say, go pound sand. Because Christ is the authority over all creation. That means my salvation is secure in him. If he created you, <coughs> certainly he can give you eternal life. And so this hymn continues to move from Christ's supremacy in creation to what is likely the most important aspect for us, his supremacy in this reconciliation. So Christ is supreme in reconciliation. Verse 18 begins by the declaration that Christ is, is the head of the body, the church. And this, of course, is not new news. It's a common refrain from Paul that we see. The church is Christ's body. There's a unity in that body. It's, we're all knit together. We're using our spiritual gifts for the bettering of one another to build up the church, to reach the lost, to love our community, etc. at all. Paul talks about this too greatly. Indeed, it is that body that Christ is the head of. The use of the image of head exists throughout the New Testament, I think 18 times. Um, this is one of the more interesting discussions uh, when you start reading the commentators because it means a bunch of things. 
We use the word head, and it means the thing on the top of your neck in some instances. Um, and sometimes it can have a range meaning from authority to leadership to source. Um, and then when you combine it with the idea of the body, there is a, a necessary correlation of Christ as head within the unity of the church. It's another say it three times fast there. In this context, what we must keep in mind is that we're dealing with Christ's supremacy. And so we cannot eliminate the idea of authority. Yet, in the same context, we see that Christ is the creator, meaning that he's the source and the sustainer of all things. And so certainly we have a double entendre going on here with just that much. All of this is to say that Christ is the head of the body, the church, and that he not only created it and sustains it, but he's also the leader of it. He also has authority over it. See, Christ takes excuse me, the church, takes its instruction from Christ. The ministry of the church is in obedience to Christ's direction and the goal of imitating Christ's ministry on earth. This, then, is to be done in unity as the body. And so this church is the vessel through which it pleased Christ to share the gospel, which is this message of reconciliation. Further, Christ is the beginning and so we need to ask the question, well, Christ is the beginning of what? And the author gives us a clue, if not clarity. Christ is the firstborn among the dead. Now we know that Christ is not the first person to be brought back to life because we read our Bibles and quickly go, what about Lazarus? Lazarus was raised, but he wasn't raised immortal. He was raised, went back to his family, and died again. Christ is the firstborn among the dead to be resurrected with a glorified body, to ascend to heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father. And so Christ, in that aspect, was the first. And so we can see how this resurrection of Christ resulted in the church. Christ was resurrected. He ascended on high, and as he promised, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in the people, and that is the birth of the church. Further, as the first resurrected, Christ serves as the prototype of all humanity. We've kind of beaten that horse to death for the past couple weeks. We're going to be resurrected. We're going to get resurrected bodies. We're going to dwell in eternity in that state. So Christ's resurrection also makes it possible for his exaltation, so that he himself may become first in all things. If I'm not mistaken, that's verse 16. First in all things translates also as the preeminent one. Preeminent one just means uh, the first in eminence, before all other things. It brings us back to this idea that we just talked about, Christ's supremacy over all creation. And now he's being articulated as the first in all things. And so we can see how these titles work together. Christ, the preeminent one, the king of kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the heir of all creation, seated at the Father's right hand. He's going to return to earth as the conqueror who defeats his enemies, sets up his kingdom, reigns as the Davidic king. As the author continues, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son. And so if we were unclear that the point is Christ is indeed God, it is now explicitly pointed out. And while as good Orthodox Protestant Christians, which we are, we assume that this is true, it has now been unequivocally expressed in God's word. Through him, as fully God and fully man, all things are reconciled to him by making peace through the blood of his cross. So just to be clear, the him is Christ and himself is God Maybe best understood as the Father, though that might be slicing the bologna too thin. God reconciles to himself all things through the blood of his cross. Reconciliation just means to restore a friendly relationship between two things. And God does this by making peace through Christ's blood shed on the cross. As a side note, it is a, a necessity for reconciliation for there to be enmity first. You don't reconcile with somebody you're already friends with, right? But you get in a fight, and then you're not friends, and then you reconcile, and you're friends again. 
And so this is the expression of the human relationship with our Creator. So as stated here, whether on earth or in heaven, all things have been reconciled to God the Father. And this takes us back full circle to see that Christ is supreme in this reconciliation. It is by his blood that all things are reconciled to God. Now here we find a difficulty because we see this word all again, and as I just informed you, all means all. And so we want to run quickly from the reconciliation of all to eternal life for all humans, powers, and supernatural beings. The problem is that we know that this is not consistent uh, with the teaching of our Orthodox Protestant faith. And indeed, the answer is twofold, I think. Maybe more than that, but two we're going to talk about. First, we must consider the context, right? And we're looking at this through the lens of Christ's work on the cross. Nothing is said of the saving faith which is required on the part of the individual to be saved. Secondly, we must understand the whole witness of Scripture. The whole witness of Scripture indicates that God's enemies will be defeated, that it is only by faith in Christ that we have eternal life, and it is those who turn away from Christ who will be judged. Another way to look at this is that the reconciliation exists, that all things are back in the proper order under God's lordship. But without the cooperative faith and submission to that lordship, a person is still in rebellion against God. There's still enmity there. And as long as that enmity exists, then the reconciliation has not been fulfilled. The idea is that humanity is already forgiven. The price has been paid. Yet, if we are unwilling to accept what is freely offered, that is the peace through Christ's blood, then we remain condemned. And so having concluded the citation of this hymn, Paul continues with the application for his readers and for us. Namely, you were once strangers and enemies in your minds as expressed through your evil deeds. But now, he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy, without blemish, and blameless before him. And I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory, pretty straightforward, pretty much where we're at. See, if we weren't enemies with God, we wouldn't need reconciliation. But we are enemies with God. And we demonstrate it by our evil deeds. Yet, by Christ's sacrifice, his death on the cross and his physical body, he has died to present us holy, without blemish, ish, and blameless before God that is washed in the cleansing blood of Christ's cross. The point is that Paul doesn't want his readers to miss the point what we ourselves must not miss. And that is that each of us is reconciled to God through Christ's death on the cross, or at least may be. Christ is indeed supreme in reconciliation. The same creator of all things, the one who is supreme over all, has authority over all, and even in death, is supreme in reconciliation. He was raised from the dead. And he has died on the cross to reconcile you and me to God so that we may have eternal life. And so if you have not already accepted this free offer of reconciliation with your creator, today is a good day to do that. The fact is we are all enemies of God until he did something about it. And the creator of all things is also the one through whom we are reconciled to God. If you want to be in right relationship with your creator, that's available. I hope that you have already made that decision. I hope that you have already placed your saving faith in Jesus Christ and accepted the forgiveness of your sins. You made him Lord of your life. But if you haven't, today's a good day. If you want to know more, come talk to me. Come talk to an elder. We will happily guide you through a gospel presentation. There's no reason for you to leave this building this morning without knowing that your eternity is secure in the Lord. I'm going to have one more side point regarding this scripture. 
Remember that this letter is not a letter of correction or rebuke, but rather of encouragement. Paul is reaffirming the things that the Colossians already know. And he reminds them to stay steadfast in this proper doctrine, and to do so, he quotes a hymn. And so as Paul borrows this early hymn, this hymn properly proclaims as well as articulates the supremacy of Christ for the benefit and assurance of the readers. You see that Paul rightly understands the power of a hymn. Maybe another way to say this is that we ought to understand what Paul seems to understand, and that is that hymns play an integral part of the framing of our theology. That's why we sing hymns. I don't remember who this quote is from, I'm paraphrasing anyway, the gist of whatever it is that you sing, that is what your theology becomes. And so we sing hymns because they have survived the test of time and standing on the foundation of correct doctrine. I do want to make a clear differentiation between the singing of hymns and contemporary worship music and not necessarily not in contemporary worship music, but among other problems, it hasn't faced the test of time. I'm quite certain that much of our contemporary Christian music will not exist in 100 years, let alone 400 years, which is you know, the foundation of our hymnal. So, all of that to say, it's good for us as Christians to be familiar with hymnody, which is the collection of hymns. I strongly encourage you to get acquainted with it. I encourage it so strongly that that is your application for this week. When you go for your quiet time this week, begin with a hymn. You high-speed, low-drag people who use the internet, open up Spotify, open up YouTube, open up whatever your music player is, search him. If you want specific suggestions, I'd be happy to give you some. If you want to borrow the red book in the back of the pew, by all means. Google is your friend. There are recordings of all of these hymns out there. Some are better than others, but it's good stuff. If none of that works for you, let me know. I will send you links to hymns that will be worth your time listening to. The point is that it benefits us to ingrain this proper doctrine. And so today we looked at Colossians 1, 15 to 22. We answered the question, what is Christ's place in creation? We saw that Christ is supreme over creation and supreme in reconciliation. That it is his supremacy and authority over all things which gives us Confidence, assurance, certainty in the fact that we are reconciled with God. Further, we have seen that Christ alone is worthy of exaltation. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, we thank you for sending your Son, who is supreme over all creation, through whom you created the heavens and the earth. And is this supremacy over all creation and the authority that it bears, which gives us confidence and an assurance in our salvation, in our reconciliation with you, and lends us to understand properly that it is only Christ who is worthy of exaltation. So we pray these things, exalting you, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ.